Thanks to Brilliant for supporting my channel. Do me a favor and take out your phone camera and just point it at something. Now take a look at the actual thing. Do they look the same? Chances are the answer is no. In fact, if you've ever seen Marcus Brownlee's smartphone camera brackets, you've seen that you can take a picture of the same thing with 10 different cameras and you'll get 10 different images. And there's a lot of reasons why that might be the case, but especially as it comes to smartphone cameras over the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of that comes down to something called computational photography. In other words, the digital processing that is performed once an optical image has been acquired that you can't achieve through normal optical means. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about how that works and start talking about how machine learning ties into all of this. Then in two weeks I'll be doing another video on how you can edit images using machine learning as well as videos and audio, so stay tuned for that. And between now and then I'm actually going to be doing a Q&A video next week since we have a lot of new faces, so leave a comment down below or tag me on Twitter using the hashtag AskJBH and I will go through your questions and pick some to answer in next week's video. Additionally, before we get too far into this, I want to shout out a great blog post that I use to help inform this video. It gives a really accessible explanation of a lot of the different processing methods that I'm going to talk about here, as well as a ton of others that I just couldn't fit into this video, so definitely check that out if you have the chance. All right, so let's start with a quick overview of how cameras actually work. As a general rule, cameras are optical instruments or instruments that interact with light that we use to capture images. The most basic cameras are sealed boxes with a small hole in them containing a photosensitive material typically called a sensor that can be used to capture images. However, you're probably more familiar with more modern cameras like the one that I am recording on today or like the one on an average phone, which contain lenses that help us focus light onto that camera sensor as well as a shutter to determine how much light the sensor is actually exposed to. Now all of this is optical acquisition. We're recording light signals based on the light that comes through or does not come through that hole in the box or the lens in my camera. But in modern digital cameras, this optical information is captured by a digital sensor, and from there you can do a lot of interesting stuff with that data. In fact, it was pretty important that someone find out how to do that interesting stuff, because it turned out that smartphones, given their size, can't actually record that much information in a single image. Those of you who may have had camera phones dating back to 2005 may remember the grainy photos that we used to be able to take on our phones, as well as the rise of things like Instagram filters that in theory, made our images look better, and in hindsight, may or may not have made them look worse. <laughs> in fact, initially when we think about computational photography, we think about things like image filters, or from things like changing the saturation of a certain color to overlaying a transparent image on top to add a grainy or a dusty looking effect to our photos, we were able to digitally change images in a way that you either couldn't do or would be rather difficult to do with a camera. And as you probably know, you can still change a lot of those photo settings once you take a photo in the native editor that happens to be on your phone. However, most phones and most photo editing software also now contains an auto feature, which will automatically adjust the different parameters of your image based on some predefined notion of what a good image looks like. In fact, even more recently, these systems rely on machine learning by passing these images through a neural network that has been trained on both raw images as well as images that have been edited to a certain degree of quality, and then applying those transformations to the new image that you give it. And as we'll dive into in the next video on this topic, machine learning actually lets us do some pretty interesting stuff to our photos, such as what we've seen recently with the Adobe Neural Filters, which can make you look older, younger, or stuff like Facetune, where you can have gray hair or end up smiling when you were sad. But before we dive into the demos that you'll see in the next video, we should talk about stacking. You might not know this, but when you open the camera app on your phone, your phone automatically starts taking photos. However, those photos are saved into a temporary buffer, so your phone will save a set of photos from the last few seconds, let's say 10 photos, and delete anything that was taken before that. So when you hit the capture button on your phone, what you're actually doing is saving the photos in that buffer, a stack of them. Why? Well, it turns out that you can use a stack of photos to create one really nice photo in a lot of different ways. One that you've probably heard of is HDR, or high dynamic range photos. HDR was designed to get around a common issue that we encounter when we're taking photos. You're at the beach and you're taking a photo of your family and the sun is in the background, so either your photo ends up with your family's faces looking great but the background completely washed out, 
or the sun looking great and everything else being basically black. However, in an HDR photo, your camera takes several pictures of the same scene at different levels of exposure or with different amounts of light in the image, and then stitches those photos together so you can have one with a normal looking sun and a normal looking family. In other words, high dynamic range photos capture the wide range of brightnesses present in an image, which you may not be able to capture using the camera in one image itself just because of limitations on how much information the camera can capture at once. And this can be useful in other situations where you want to capture a wide range of something too. For example, if you've ever seen those long exposure photos where you're looking at stars moving across the sky in one image, and so you just see streaks across the sky, you can do that with a standard optical camera, but it requires very precise camera settings and making sure that nothing moves out of place. Instead, most smartphones can do this by taking several pictures over a certain predefined period of time and then just stitching them together in post. And in fact, things like Night Sight on the Pixel actually combine HDR with machine learning, where photos at different levels of exposure are taken, taking into account the fact that we are looking at a dark image, so the exposure times are going to be on average probably longer to let even more light in than a typical HDR image. And then those photos are combined into the HDR image and processed using machine learning to tweak different aspects of the photo so that you get those really nice shots that we see. Now, I don't want to go too far into stacking, so I'll just say that other examples of places where stacking is useful is panorama photos, as well as focus correction and image stabilization. So if you've ever wondered how your camera is able to take photos when your hands are shaking, that's why. So now that we've talked about some of the history of computational photography, I want to talk a little bit about a more recent development in the field, which is real-time computational photography methods. Specifically, we're going to talk a little bit about some work that recently came out of NVIDIA last year. Now, why might you need real-time computational photography? Well, if you're like me, you've probably been spending a lot of time on Zoom in the last year. And it turns out that machine learning-based computational photography can actually help out a lot for video conferencing. Options include face reanimation, so if you have a second monitor that you need to look at, we can use machine learning to make it look like you've been looking at the camera. Generation of high-resolution images from low-resolution images so people can see your face well even in low light and with a cheap webcam, and real-time video compression which essentially creates a deep fake of you in real time so that your computer doesn't have to send as much information over the internet. And that last one is helpful for anyone who has a poor internet connection so that you don't have to turn your camera off in order to hear what other people are saying. Other examples of computational photography that you might not have known were computational photography include the reconstructed black hole image that went viral a year ago, as well as some recent research from MIT on how to design design algorithms that can see around corners. In short, computational photography can help us see things that we might not be able to see with our eyes and generally makes our photos look better on Instagram. And again, I highly recommend checking out that blog post and staying tuned for the next video in two weeks if you want to learn more about other methods of computational photography that I'm not going to cover in this video. Now, I know that there are a lot of new faces on my channel this week, and I've gotten some questions about how to get started with statistics, machine learning, and data science, whether it be for a new year's resolution or just because you want to dip your toes and for those people, I'd highly recommend Brilliant, a website and app that makes learning interactive, accessible, and fun. Brilliant has a great set of courses on neural networks and algorithms, and they just introduced a new statistics course that will help you create a solid foundation for the rest of your machine learning journey. Or if you're not there yet, you can start with one of their courses on mathematical thinking to help you take your first steps towards your learning goals. Brilliant's approach is based on problem solving and active learning. It's about seeing concepts visually and interacting with them so they stick. And their courses are laid out like a story, broken down into pieces so that you can tackle them a little bit at a time. The best part is there's no tests and no grades, so you can just pick a course based on what you're interested in and get going. To take the first step on your learning journey, go to brilliant.org slash Jordan or click on the link in the description and sign up for free. In fact, the first 200 people who go to that link will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription.